Welcome everyone. Please note this event is being recorded and will be available on social media. Please remain muted during the entire event. At this time, I ask you to turn off your video to maximize the quality of the recording. Only the readers will have video on. To maximize your viewing, click on speaker view at the top right hand corner. Thank you, Maria Pia. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Christopher Dorado. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, uh, the AICW is pleased to present Rapid Fire Readings, uh, which is part of the Books and Biscotti literary series. Uh, before we begin, um, I want to make a land acknowledgement. Uh, I recognize that we are all located on different territories at this time. But I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge, uh, to acknowledge that I am broadcasting from unceded Indigenous lands. I am currently in Chachake, otherwise known as Montreal, uh, home of the Ganyagahaga Nation. The Ganyagahaga are recognized as the custodians of the lands and waters on which we gather today. Chachake, Montreal is hysterically known as a gathering place for many First Nations and the Association of Italian Canadian Writers acknowledge them and other nations who care for the land across our country, uh, and we pay our respects to Canada's first storytellers. As uh, the name suggests, uh, rapid fire readings move very quickly. We have 16 members of the AICW who will read for about two minutes each. Uh, well, I shouldn't say about two minutes each, uh, two minutes each, uh, that's only 120 seconds. Um, we'll follow a specific pre-established order of readers. Maria Pia, Licha, and I will take turns calling uh, readers to the mic and keeping time. A buzzer, a buzzer, which sounds like, Maria Pia, are you going to play it? Yes. <laughs> so there'll be a buzzer uh, that sounds like this, and it signals when the reader has to stop. Uh, the reader will be muted right after the buzzer sounds. And so writers, please get ready to jump into, uh, into reading mode whenever your name is called. So, um, and I wanna also encourage people uh, during this time, feel free to use the chat, share what you're thinking in the chat. Feel free to, to reach out right to other readers too about what, what you're sharing. The goal of this uh, is really to get a, a sampling of a lot of the work that our members are doing. So we are going to begin with our first reader. Uh, and it's Anthony Portulese. Anthony, welcome to the stage. Thanks. Please, Signora, beseeches no no of the nurse over FaceTime, his heavy voice quivering. You can, you can take her hand. I no want her all alone. I, I no want her be scared. She's no longer conscious, but her eyelids often flicker. A large plastic pipe impales her throat, a vicious gag taped over her mouth. Machines push and pull breath in and out of her lungs. We can hear the hoarseness in her quaking chest. Tubes slither all over her blanket. They poke and puncture her gaunt arms. A helpless little fly caught in a web of plastic wires. Whenever she jolts, we freeze. Maybe she's about to wake. Maybe she's about to slip away. The nurse strokes her damp hair and Nono blubbers a lullaby into the microphone. I can't make out his words. They're full of love, of devastation. The notes tremble through his teeth. Heartache bleeds from his lips. He's almost 90 and doesn't care about his health. He wants to be there in the final moments to complete his husbandly duty. But we forced him to stay away, to keep him breathing, but no longer living. My father looks to his brother. For a split second, their resolve breaks. Doubt seeps through them both. Was it worth it? Should we have let him go to her? No, we mustn't. We cannot lose them both. Yet haven't we though? Thank you, Anthony. Well done. Um, moving over now to Annalisa Panati. Annalisa. Here I am. Thank you, Chris. So I have tried for this particular event to write a poem about, uh, let's say, love. Uh, I have time only to read you an Italian or English version and I choose to read in Italian. So adesso vi leggerò un, una poesia nuova in italiano. Il titolo è L'amore sovraesposto. Ci sarebbe voluto silenzio per accorgersi del vibrare dell'anima, come il ronzio di un trasformatore distante, 
come un messaggio da mondi lontani. Ci sarebbe voluto silenzio per ascoltarlo e tempo per decifrarlo. Ma il silenzio si interruppe nell'improvviso fragore di una cascata di parole d'amore. E ci sarebbe voluto freddo per calmare l'agitarsi del cuore, per lasciare che si posino le gocce di esplosioni di gioia in preziosi diamanti di neve. Ma il freddo si sciolse nell'ansioso calore di bollenti passioni d'amore. E ci sarebbe voluto più buio per far uscire dall'ombra i nostri spaventati segreti, la parte di noi che si nasconde con i demoni e gli animali notturni, per far girare la faccia nascosta della luna e per vedere attraverso l'oscurità il nostro volto più vero. Ma anche il buio si dissolse nel chiarore di un flash scattato nell'ansia di fotografare l'amore. Così sono rimaste parole e passioni. È rimasta una fotografia. L'amore invece se n'è andato via. Grazie, thank you everyone. Grazie Annalisa. Um, all right, um, moving on to Elio Iannacci. Elio. Boxes. Pat Benatar, we belong, flip. Madonna, like a prayer, flip. La Belle, moon shadow, flip. Jesus Christ, John, how many records did Dante buy? We're going to be here all day with these goddamn boxes. Don't start with me, Kyle, John snapped. You promised you'd help. What exactly do you want me to say? Dante loved these singers. I'll never understand, Kyle said. Why do we always have to listen to the same old songs over and over again? John turned to a box and kicked it before he answered. Because there are so few songs out there for us. This stack right here, it's ready for donation. Jody Watley, still a thrill, flip. Sade, paradise, flip. Kyle thought about how Dante would look in a mahogany box laid out in a suit, how Dante's family would survey his friends like they were infected with that mad cow disease the news kept going on and on about. The funeral would be one big wall of brown Italian eyes radiating blame and repulsion. We should keep some of Dante's records, John suggested. He always said Joni Mitchell was his real mother anyway. Sure, John, Kyle fugued. Let's plan a party and play these has-beens all night. Can you please focus? The hospice will be here in an hour to pick these hag records up. John slipped Diana Ross's surrender on his out of its album sleeve and queued it up on Dante's record player. Out of its dusty speaker, a thin voice blasted through the grime. Kyle heard John begin to half sing the song's lyrics. Remember me as a big balloon at a carnival that ended too soon. Remember me as a breath of spring. Remember me as a good thing. Thank you. Beautiful, thank you so much, Elio. Um, I'm looking here. Uh, Dosi Cotrineo, Dosi. Yes, hi. So I'm gonna read a poem. Um, and it was, uh, it just came to me following a tragedy. My son's best friend was killed in a car accident and he was like a son to us. And that happened in August, uh, 2020, uh, 2013 rather. So this was written for Theodore. If the top of the Eiffel Tower should snap off because an elephant sneezed or a giraffe coughed, if all of the butterflies turned into moths, I would still love you. If Big Ben and London should run out of time, or if all of the quarters turned into dimes, if the road crews were ordered to stop painting lines, I would still love you. If China decided to stop growing tea, or the fish stopped swimming in the seven seas, I could never stop dreaming about you and me, because I would still love you. If the stars in the sky should run out of light, or the moon shone at day and the sun at night, if Hercules lost all of his might, I would still love you. If all of the birds forgot how to fly, or people stopped saying hello, just goodbye, it'd be hard to get up, but I would surely try, because I would still love you. If the trees in the forest ever stop growing, or the north and the south pole decide to stop snowing, I could keep on smiling because of knowing, I would still love you. If Mount Everest becomes the size of a pea, or the planet runs out of honey and bees, if two plus one stops equaling three, I would still love you. If the entire world goes on a big, huge strike 
because of fighting over wrong or right. I'll shut off the news and turn off the light because I would still love you. And if I live to be 107 or the 12 months of the year turn into 11, I'll count down the days till we meet in heaven because I would still love you. Thank you. Thank you so much, switching hosts here. Um, thanks to our four readers. Calling Christy Ratto to the mic. Thank you, Licha. All right, this is uh, from a work in progress. Pat doesn't remember his father too much now. Back then, he was a passing ghost, rarely showed any emotion, never gave a kiss or displayed affection to his wife or kids. His was a stern face that sipped soup loudly at the table. Not that his father was mean, but there was a lot of yelling in the house. Or maybe it was just talking loudly, calling Pat to come or get out of the way or go help your mother or wash your hands or just do what you're goddamn told. Pat didn't mean to misbehave, but it seemed like he was always in the wrong. His eldest sisters, Carmela and Elisa, would defend him. Leave him alone, Pop, they'd say to their dad in English. He's just a kid. Let him have his fun. Both Carmela and Elisa worked long days at Northern Electric. Along with Mateo, they were often called upon to take care of their younger siblings, but they too wanted to have fun. The three eldest had to leave school early in order to get jobs and help support the family. On weekends, Carmela and Elisa would take what little money they were allowed to keep and go to the movies. Pat would ask them to take them with him, but they always said no. He wouldn't like the romances they wanted to see, and besides, they'd be back way past his bedtime. One night, he heard the two come home late with their father still up. Where were you, Gennaro snapped, Pat watching the scene from a crack in the bedroom door. It's almost midnight. We were downtown, Pop, Elisa said, placing her coat on the kitchen chair. At the movies, we, didn't, we were on the other side of the canal and there was an accident. We had to wait until it was cleared to, no, you weren't, their father interrupted. You lie, you were at the dance at St. Gabriel's, I know. His sisters could never hold up a lie. It would collapse immediately if challenged. Pop, we, I don't want my girls dancing with the boys from the point, he said. His father tapped the side of his temple. They only have one thing on their mind. You, he said to Carmelo, you sweep the floor and you, this time pointing at Elisa, you wash it. I want the kitchen clean by the time your mother gets up. His dad then rose from the table and went to bed. What was wrong with dances? The only ones Pat ever saw seemed harmless, put on the streets of Goose Village, men on one side, women on the other. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Rosanna Battigelli, you're next. By the River from La Brigantessa, Calabria, 1862. Gabriella smiles wistfully, watching the water gushing a short distance from her feet. She can't deny that there has been something different in the air between them for months. Her stomach tightens as Tonino sits down on a flat rock next to her. Gabriella, I want you. She lifts her head. His dark chestnut eyes are intense for my wife. Her heart jolts. She doesn't pull away when Tonino takes her hands in his. She likes the way his big hands cover hers. They are hard, but warm and gentle at the same time. Mi vuoi, Gabriella, he says softly. For a moment, as the river whispers and gushes, she wonders if he has really spoken, but when he repeats the words, she knows it was in her imagination. Do I want him, she muses, dazed? Yes, she finally whispers, her cheeks aflame. She is overcome by the sight of his eyes misting. Her lips quiver at his first tentative kiss, their locked hands held between them. When Tonino's lips part from hers, they sit looking at each other for countless moments, with only the river and the sparrows breaking the silence. Then Tonino suddenly gets up, walks over to a nearby oleander bush, and snips off a few blossoms. He arranges them gently in her hair. For my Calabrisella, he murmurs against her ear, my Calabrian girl. Thank you. Grazie, grazie Rosanna. Darlene Madot, you're next. The narrator of Bottled Roses has canceled a wedding two weeks to the date, but coincidentally bumps into the groom while shopping with her mother. My mother was standing on the sidewalk crying, oblivious to the parting wave of people that passed her. I put a, an arm around her shoulder. She felt so delicate, like a frightened little bird. My rage left me, left me extraordinarily without bitterness or defense. Please, mom, 
It's hard enough. I'm sorry, it's such a shame. Mom, I don't regret it. Are you sure, Jean? Are you really sure? Yes, please stop crying. Sobbing into one soaked Kleenex, she choked out her words. I'm sorry, it's just that love's such a precious thing. I'd be nothing without your father, nothing. I can't stand to think of you without what we've got. And I knew that for my mother, this was one of life's unstated truths. My father was the still point in her life, a man profoundly committed as husband and father to being what he was. He let us commit ourselves to what we were, even if it meant letting us make our own mistakes. I think my sisters and I learned to trust our parents' love in a way so deep the knowledge of it could be assumed. It had that quality of permanence that gives life its whole shape and meaning. So my mother, at that moment on the sidewalk, wanting the best for her daughters, wanted love. It's so important to love someone, to have someone you can share things with. What else is there? What does it mean? Without love, it's all just selfishness. Thank you, thank you. That was really great. Um, I'm going to call to the mic, Dominic Cusmano. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. I will be reading to you uh, uh, an excerpt, actually the introduction to a short story I'm working on. Um, the, the story is called The Hunter. It's about a murder. From high above, the myriad lakes and rivers nestled in the rugged serenity of the Laurentian mountains glitter like precious stones. Carved deep into the land, their waters course placidly opposite steely blue skies, nourishing the sumptuous forests that surround them. An infinity of spiraling firs, spruces, cedars, and lesser shrubs fuse together to make the forest seem impenetrable and mysterious. The air is still and the soil damp. Sun rays that have found a chink in the armor of foliage mark the ground with tiny flickers of light, appearing even brighter against the shadows cast by the ramparts of trees that surround them. Winter comes early in these parts, foreshadowed by a cool, unrelenting Arctic breeze that by late September transforms the once opulent greens into an impressionist tableau of deathly reds, yellows, and browns. The dying leaves parachute to the ground in countless numbers, blanketing the terrain. The inviting waters, already cool on the warmest of days, become deadly cold before they freeze over. Forest creatures, big and small, their instincts attuned to the cycle of nature, forage and burrow about in their ritualistic scramble to survive the changing seasons. In a clearing, a solitary moose, majestic and benign, stands against a, a backdrop of indifferent trees. He turns his head, heedless to the barrel of a distant rifle pointed in his direction. The jarring sound of gunshots reverberates over the trees and hastily dissipates in time and distance. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, up next is Silvia Falsaperla. My first poem is called Transit of Venus, up the ladder to the telescope at Arcerti uh, Observatory, nearby a villa where Galileo was once under house arrest. I saw your luminescent surface, the grand opulescence of it, the first planet my puny eye witnessed. I always looked up at the night sky for you, the brightest star, ignoring even the moon, our night lamp crescent spotted sphere, sometimes so close to earth, an imposing shield. Now, June 5, 2012, with a pair of solar shades, I see the sun glowing round, waiting for you, O oh Venus, orb of love. I see you transit, a dance, a beauty mark on the face of the sun. I once re revered you in my youth, caught in your gravitational robes, the blast gashes and the grief of it all. I had to see you because I am transitory. In a hundred years, I won't be here for the next show. Your faithful subject. And the next poem is dedicated to my late dog. At dawn, a visitor. At dawn, not finding me in bed, 
you look for me in the other room with the shared sofa, where I am sleeping in a, co in a cocoon blanket, subduing the frigid cold. Beloved, you find me snorting warmth through your warm, I'm sorry. Beloved, you find me snorting warmth through your mouth and nostrils, doggy eyes of wordless love. You slump on the wooden floor. <laughs> okay. Mike, uh, Lucia Cascioli. Sam, Sam. I uttered, giggled, tisked, whispered, and cooed his name so many times I could wrap it around the world twice. He's been the man in my life for 15 years, always pawing me, flopping on my couch, eating my food without complaints, and up to no good now and again. He's the one who nudges me awake before my alarm clock screams, panting for attention. Sam is my dog. What were you thinking? If ever there was a need for a furry four-legged friend over the last 730 days, 12 hours and 19 minutes, it's been during this time. If ever there was a need for unconditional love, it's been during my entire lifetime. I never really knew what love was until I looked into Sam's deep brown eyes. He's golden a retriever to be precise, but his color seeps through to his core. There's something about a dog who smiles and wags his tail every time he sees me. Sam speaks with his eyes and they never disappoint. We may not speak the same language, but we understand each other perfectly. As a bonus, he's kept me fit over the years, chasing squirrels and rabbits, the scent of a fox lingering on Saturday morning dew, or a morning dove waddling across the driveway, teasing him until a last second takeoff. He'll bring me one someday and dump it on the welcome mat before grinning and kicking his hind legs back to make his point. I say this knowing it won't be true. Sam is going to leave me soon. He has the C word. I can't even say it. It's spread. He's on meds for the pain, yet he still smiles while my heart breaks. His love has healed me, but I can't heal him. If there is a heaven where our souls can meet again, Sam will be there to vouch for me. Here, boy. Thanks. I'm going to call uh, to the mic, Eloise Carbone. Thank you. This poem was written in January after the passing of one of my spiritual teachers, Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh. Journey to nowhere. An ocean of shaven heads bends to touch the earth, bodies draped in golden robes, eyes lowered open to wake. Outstretched arms transport your sacred body protected by silk umbrellas in procession through Hue Temple to the full moon hall, now decorated with thousands of golden daisies and your circles of calligraphy. Walk with me. Thousands witness as they lift you to the sky three times in prostration, to the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha. They place you in a wooden casket, gold trimmed and cover you with curls of shaven sandalwood. The air fills with its sweet warm fragrance and the chanting of the heart sutra, gate gate paragate parasamgate bodhi swoha. I remember you Thai sitting under that cherry blossom tree so many years ago a cup of tea cradled in the palm of your hand, and you said, this cup of tea holds all of existence, we enter our. And now with love overflowing, we remember your voice. I am here for you, no fear, no death. No tears are shed, we know you are, as you always were on a journey to nowhere. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Eloise. Uh, love these tributes. A lot of people making tributes to other people and to lost pets. Um, so thank you. It's a great, great way to remember. Um, writing is a really great way to kind of extend people's lives. So thank you, everyone. 
Um, I can't believe we're already entering the last uh, quarter of uh, the last round of, of, uh, of readers we have. I am going to turn it over now to Licha. Thank you, Chris. Uh, love, not always what we think it is. Rules not to be broken. He knows the one who gets up last makes the bed. She knows the one who cooks doesn't clean up. They know. One does the laundry, the other folds, puts clothes away. She does the laundry, she folds, opens drawers, closes drawers. I just won't do it right, he says. He gets up last, she makes the bed. He cooks, she cleans up the kitchen. She gets up last, she makes the bed. She cooks, he doesn't clean up the kitchen. Well, well, he laughs, rules are made to be broken. And I didn't agree to these rules, your rules. She goes on strike. One day, one week, one month, new rules. He cooks, takes out the trash, recycling, compostable bin. She does the rest. No one irons, ever. And I'm going to read something in dialect. Pute abandona. Uno, sentasse una carighetta in un campo in piantasa, na putea piange, cavando obietue, so mamma si sposta pian pianin, e a putea ciapa sue a carighetta, se senta rente so mamma, che suga e agrime. Basta sigare, dai, che fra poco andemo anche no antre dove che se, e a putea piange. Due, pedalla, pedalla, dai, via veloce, lungo l'adese, Par vedere a piazza e accesa il campanile e bancarei de carame dove che il ga portà prima di andare via. Domenica i che diceva tutti davanti al duomo, che bea tutea che te assi qua. Pedaia, pedaia, dai, via da qua. Grazie. Thank you, Licia. Our next reader is Caroline Di Giovanni. Caroline. Okay, hello. Hi. I'm going to read from my, my new little book, Poems for Two Worlds. The last poem is rather long. And so I decided just to read the last two sections. The name of the poem is A Woman Reads Dante. I imagine a, a woman having to do exercises in Dante to get her degree and she's rather annoyed. Purgatorio. My little life appears so small compared to many others. Dreams and ambitions fade in time. Where is a Virgil to guide me? What about Emily Dickinson? My household is my universe. Where would Dante put me on his mountain? There must be a place for non-achievers. A fitting punishment is the burden of pro procrastination. I carry around like a basket of wet laundry. Someday I will hang it out to dry, but not today. The wind is high. I'm afraid I would be blown away. Paradiso. Sipping my tea, I think again about the love Dante describes that moves the earth and all the stars. His planetary metaphor is brilliant. Yet I think of love another way, as a wide ocean holding me, allowing me to float and swim, to move at my own speed, sometimes feeling lost, but always returned above the surface, even after a frightening dive. This love has majesty and power. As a woman, I think I too exist in power and mystery, able to mother children, able to- All right, thank you so much, Caroline. Um, and uh, now we are going to hear from our final reader uh, this, uh, this morning, this afternoon, uh, Carmelo Militano. Carmelo. I'm going to be reading from uh... Catching Desire, which is kind of connected to uh, another, hopefully I can read from both. So this is uh, Modigliani's uh, uh, model. 
She waits in a small cafe not far from his studio. She knows he, he paints until the late afternoon, takes small sips from a short stemmed demitasse rimmed with thin gold band after each stroke. She remembers how it caught the light whenever he raised it to his lips. He looked at her, paused, looked again to be certain. They both sat in front of the open window. It was a May morning, sunlight white as silver, drunk, covered in sweat, when he finally smiled and put his brushes down. She remembers the lovemaking was never the same, sometimes gentle, the air around them breaking into murmurs, arms and legs wrapped around each other in the shape of a half-formed cocoon, or he poured into her, gripped her breast like a drowning man, mounted, pushed into her in a furious rage, ending in delirium. She knows he is preparing his bath. She knocks, turns the long door handle, enters the room. The first thing she sees is a small white back. It leans against the curved end of a gray zinc tub. She shuts the door behind her gently, turns the small lock, and imagines for a brief moment both his fingers knotted on her nipples. They stare at each other like uncertain chess players. She takes in the odors of the room, sardines, tobacco smoke, mold, decayed wood, scented orange smoke, varnish, oil paint. He turns away, continues to bathe. She watches him pour water over his head, lather his hair, eyes closed. It is then she approaches him, takes the cup from his hand, pours the lukewarm, lukewarm water over his hand, pours again, asks him to stand. He rises like a young Poseidon, dripping. Okay, so that's, uh, well, am I done? <laughs> Now I'm going to quickly do this. Who finds these words? Secretary Slavin. Okay, that's it. Okay, I'm done. Thank you, Carmelo. Wow, that that went by very fast. That was that it was did. wonderful, everyone. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Uh, thank you to all the readers. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the buzzer. <laughs> I got buzzed. <laughs> so that was that was fast and fun and not too stressful. And, and we didn't really hear the buzzer too often. So thanks, everyone. It's time to wrap up. Readers, thank you for sharing your writing. Friends and family, thanks for joining us today. And thanks so much to Christy Rado and Maria Pia Spadafora and our communications host, Delia DeSantis, even though we didn't hear her voice at this event. Uh, this free, free event on Zoom was brought to you by the Association of Italian Canadian Writers, which is run by a group of volunteers. We welcome donations at any time. Go to AICW.ca to donate and to find out more about our association. And we look forward to other books and biscotti uh, events or rapid fire reading events in the future. Thank you.